The Voice of Reason podcast, taking the time and recording it. Hello, this is Benjamin Boyce, and welcome to another episode of The Voice of Reason podcast. Today's guest, alike the last guest, actually the same person in the last episode, is Philip Tanzer or Logan McCree. And in this episode, we speak about sexuality, masculinity, men's rights, and his journey from, I guess, from through homosexuality into a different relationship with his sexuality. Um, Seems kind of heterosexual at this point or homosexual or bisexual. I don't know if the categories of that even make sense at this point for somebody like him. But we do get into this and tie his sexuality and masculinity, or he does, he explains how his sexuality and masculinity is tied to his spiritual development or his process of becoming a fuller, richer, more wise and self-reflective human being. This is a really deep conversation, and I would like to put it out there that there are some parts that aren't exactly explicit, but it is rather adult material. So that all being said, here is Logan McCree. How did you get, end up getting into men's rights activism? What prompted you to do that? So three, three quick steps. By the way, are you recording this? Um, of course I am. Good. No, no, no that's <laughs> because I really don't want to talk about all of this a second time. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Good. Um, so I would say three big steps. First step was I was a kid in school or a teenager in school and a girl slapped me in the face because um, like a ki- another kid threw a wet sponge at me and I ca- I caught it. And because it was wet, she got a little bit wet. So she slapped me in the face and then I slapped her in the face. And she looked in the same strength, exact same strength, so not hard or anything. And she didn't hit me hard. But the shock on her face really surprised me. But I I was like, equality? <laughs> mm. And because I, I don't know how old I was. I must have been like 11 years old. First of all, I, I, I had always more interested in interest in men and also it was I think before your hormones go crazy and before you treat women differently so at that time you would still kind of treat the other gender similar to your own gender in some ways so I was very shocked how shocked she was and I was like sorry I thought I thought that was what equality was about if you hit me I hit you back if you're nice to me I'm nice to you Hmm. so that was the first step second step was I was in the military and almost all my friends in the military lost their children in custody battles. Um, my best friend, he uh, faced false allegations. Another friend, a good friend of mine, he uh, was alienated from kind of both of his sons. One of his sons is slowly coming back. The other one doesn't talk to him at all uh, because he was demonized by the mother. And so that was step two and step three was at the age of 32, I started dating women again. And my first thought after I realized that I could have relationships with women again, my first thought was, wow, I could, I can have a family. And my second thought was, I don't want to lose my children. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And this Damocles sword was hanging above me. And also at this point, I when you change your sexuality or when you expand on your sexuality and when you deal with women not as humans but as women from a heterosexual point of view your whole attitude changes all of a sudden you're not the nice gay guy anymore you're the potential predator and Hmm. um, women react to you differently you have less freedom in society Uh, there is much more restrictions when you are when you're straight i would say and are you and saying you that gay men have have certain privileges then they have absolutely privilege absolutely and we we definitely i i really want to make if you're interested i would love to talk about that in a different video with you because um for me going the other way around i think i have certain insight that some other people don't have um sargon of Akkad, he did a video i don't know if you read the article there was an article about transgender man 
that were talking about their experiences after transitioning from woman to man and that they said, oh my God, I thought there was male privilege, but actually we had privileges as women that we don't have anymore now. And I felt the same way uh, when I actually transitioned. <laughs> No, when I hmm. expanded my sexuality towards be um, having relationships with women again, there are certain things where, as a straight, as a gay man, you are not as free. That there is, there are some restrictions by society, and then there are some restrictions that you put on yourself as a gay man or as a gay person. Like, uh, like what? Could you? Could you? Uh... Not holding hands. So, for example, if I would hold hands in public, I would always be aware that I was a man holding another man's hand. And I would be uh, aware people might look... Um, yeah, there's there was an uncomfortable feeling around that. Once I started dating women, for me, holding the hand of, of my girlfriend, who was very beautiful, uh, was pride i was proud of holding her hand and i was like it was like look at what i've got <laughs> so that hmm. was a very very different experience and very nice one but it does come with a lot of negatives when if you want to have sex with a with a man when you're gay you just say wanna fuck and then you have sex um and sex hmm. for a gay man is so readily accessible which obviously is a huge problem for gay men because there are no boundaries there is there are no restrictions and it's very easy to spiral down into self-destruction hmm. for straight men it's incredibly difficult to to have any interaction with women i'm i'm quite a shy guy and for me i need to and we're really getting off of topic here. No, no, no. Uh, we, we don't have any topic. We were supposed to talk about something completely even different. This is more interesting to me because this fits into the aspects of uh, the, the anthropological aspects that I'm actually more interested in is how, do, I, I how does sexuality of, interact with, with our humanity. And, and I watched a lot of your content about on transgenderism and I find it incredibly fascinating. And there are so many things where I really want to get into because there are aspects about my sexuality that I don't understand. I don't like the LGBT community or aspects about the LGBT community, um, like the promiscuity, the, tr the fact that drugs are so readily available and that it's not criticized, um, superficial um, attitudes that if you're gay, you have to follow certain lifestyles. The, and, and my dislike towards that, I can understand. But there is something about gays, lesbians, and transgender people, when I interact with a lot of them, I like them as people, but there is something un uneasy. I, I feel like there's something wrong. And I have, in parts, the same feeling about me. And it's not that it's a bad thing. So I'm, I'm quite thankful for the brokenness inside me because it taught me many lessons. But I think that almost every um, gay individual that I've ever met had a certain amount of brokenness within them. And I don't know if this brokenness comes from not fitting into society or if the brokenness was there before. And if the brokenness is actually why they um, express their sexuality gay or, or do, do you know what I'm talking about it's it's mm. very difficult it's very difficult because it's a it's much more a spiritual feeling that I have um, and like you walk into a room and there is a person and you have this first impression of the person and the first impression can be positive or it can be negative or you're like oh that's a person I want to hang out with and with a lot of um, gay people, I have this, there is something that I can't put my finger on that most of them have in common. It makes them different. It, and this difference. And you see that in you or you, you've seen that in you? Okay, of course. Uh, yeah, I definitely see that in me as well. Um, <clears throat> which, which can also be a gift because you see things in a different way. Um, a lot of gay artists um, were 
only able to express themselves in the way they did because of their sex their otherness hmm. so and the if i was if i was straight from being a child if i had always been straight I have no idea who I would be now. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't think as much about life, society, myself, sexuality, about all of that. I, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't think as much about that as I do now. Um, masculinity doesn't come as natural to me as to some other people, I think. I, I have to work for it. Do you know the writer Jack Donovan? Uh, no, I don't. So Jack Donovan is um, a writer he wrote um, the best book ever written about masculinity it's called the way of man um, hmm. before he wrote that he wrote another book called androphilia and it's about men that love men and he doesn't like the term gay so he loves men as well i don't know where he is now on his journey i think he has a little bit a similar journey that i'm on uh, but he's not vocal about it. He's not because he doesn't want it. He wrote this book and I put, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if he's happy that he ever released this book. I'm very happy that he released the book because it be does take because very, blowback. You think he, yeah, well, the thing is he is, he is an icon in the manosphere and in the very very masculine manosphere he's a okay. he's a really tough guy and most guys in the military or i would say a lot of guys in the military have read his books and the fact that he loves or loved man is what most people use to attack him so as soon as okay. somebody wants to destroy his masculine self they poke at that and hmm. because as a gay man, it's you, you constantly have to ask yourself, who am I as a gay man? What, what am I? There are, no, there are no normal role models. There are very, very few masculine gay men. Okay. And when you, when you switched from uh, or expanded from homosexuality to, to heterosexuality, how did your, your relationship with, with your love of man change or alter so <clears throat> i i was always interested in men so as far as i can remember I, I i i needed male energy around me and it had to be masculine energy and i think it has to do and i think that's the case in a lot of gay men um a lack of masculine presence in, in form of the father. I grew up with my father, but my father wasn't very present and we weren't very close and my father is more a soft guy. And I was always looking for um, <laughs> tough guys that I could look up to. So, I, I, But I'm not saying, obviously, I'm not saying that the lack of masculinity in childhood made me gay, but it definitely influenced my, my sexuality because I was always looking for a very manly man. And I don't know to what extent I was looking for the man that I wanted to be mm -hmm. or, or a comrade or a father figure. It, it, it's, I was definitely looking for a father figure, but at one point this and sexuality starts to blend into each other and it's very mm -hmm. difficult to separate where you wanted a father figure and where it turned into daddy issues. Hmm. Um, and, but even when I was a teenager, I, I called myself asexual with a tendency towards men because I didn't really want to have sex with men, but I knew that I was drawn to men and hmm. people started to say, Oh, so you're gay. And I'm like, no, I, I'm asexual with a tendency towards men. Oh, so you're gay? And I'm like, no, not really. And they're like, oh, you have to be mm. proud to be gay. Come out. Uh, and I felt very mm. pushed by society to identify as gay. And it wasn't the gay community that did that. It was overall community because, yeah. um, and that was 25 years ago, but it was so yeah. gay positive. It wasn't gay neutral. It wasn't, well, it doesn't matter. It was like, oh, it's great. 
and you sh you should do that. Nobody said, well, if you like men, that's fine, but maybe one day you're gonna like a woman, and that's also fine. Mm -hmm. That it seemed like that wasn't an option back then. I think that has changed a little bit. I'm not a huge fan of this whole movement with gender fluidity and fluid sexuality, but I do think that nowadays it's easier for somebody to make experiences with men and with women and decide later on what you want to be. I think the rigid uh, boxes of gay and straight are a bit softer. I, I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's interesting. The... the uh the movement to towards gay acceptance needed to create a gay category, which then has all this other baggage that you're not necessarily signing up for. Like your, your sexuality then becomes like this component of a whole uh, personal construct that you're supposed to create. And then when we go into more refinement with uh, gender fluidity or uh, fluid sexuality, um, that, that, that can release those bonds, but there's a, uh, a threat that that becomes another rigid box in and of itself. Like this is like my sexuality is such a huge component of my personality. I have to put it in my bio. It has to be right up front. Um, that's how I market myself to the world. My but comment. the thing is, obviously, by having this strong gay box um, that was created or that was there, you obviously also other yourself yourself. These are the straight mm. people, we are the gay people, which makes it much harder for the other side to hate you. If you don't other yourself as much, if you say, look man, I'm the same as you. I just make slightly different decisions and I don't know where the journey is going. I was in the military for three years and nobody had a problem with me being, being gay because I didn't make a big deal around it. Um, it I, I think that this out and proud and I do understand that there was a potentially a need for that but this gay pride um, it never sat well with me because I just wanted to be myself so so I was pushed in the gay box and I, at one point I was like okay let's do this gay thing here and I went to gay bars and I felt very uncomfortable because back then I looked a, a little bit like Marilyn Manson and I was really into heavy metal and stuff like that so I had like leather clothes and in the gay the gay scene is very judgmental and I really didn't fit in there um, and I and I started going into well I stumbled into a leather bar and people there was were much more accepting to otherness, I would say, if the otherness fitted in with their group. Well, so so, so actually they weren't they were not more accepting. They I just I, looked more can, like them. Yeah. Can I ask you a question on that? You sure. brought up earlier that that the uh, the courting rituals that have been developed between men and women. And probably because there's so much consequence to sexual interaction, it leads to a child, you know, which completely changes the life for everybody involved in that. Those courting rituals slow down the sexual activity and then cause the man at least to focus more on being uh, putting on a face and developing the, the the other parts of their being rather than sexuality. With the with what you said with homosexuality, that that's not there. That courting ritual is not there, so that the sexuality can just spiral or 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 become, uh, you said that it can lead into uh, no breaks. Part. Yes. And so uh, my I question is, do you think that the judgmentalism within the gay community has come in to replace that? Or if, if that operates as a way to uh, restrain social behaviors into uh, easily manageable terms because that other courting ritual stuff isn't there? I was in more than one minority group. I was in the gay community and I was also in the gothic um, scene. And in both minority groups, I encountered much more prejudice and um, superficial discrimination, I would say, than in, in the normal society. Um, they othered themselves and they wanted acceptance from outside, but they did not accept the outside and they also didn't accept people on the inside that didn't play exactly by the same rules as um, as they did so back then mm. and obviously the rules are changing I guess today 
if if I had if I would look today the way I looked back then I would just be called gender fluid because I looked like a, like Marilyn Manson and I was wear, sometimes wearing dresses and stuff like that so everybody would say oh you're so hipster or you're so cool and people would uh, like force me into a non-binary construct uh, which I never was and the thing is I have the symbol of prince tattooed all over my body the male and female symbol combined because I always believed in like the balance between the male and the female and I did express mm -hmm. that in my clothes so actually I was mm -hmm. non-binary or I was gender fluid long before it was hip but for me it wasn't a political thing it was much more a spiritual search yeah. and yeah. yeah and I think that that has always been part of society and there have always been people playing with with gender norms but it was it was a spiritual thing or it was a, a philosophical question not a political question and yeah. they're yeah. they're instrumentalizing it now in a political way which is incredibly dangerous and they force their worldview onto others instead of just exploring it themselves and then sharing what they experience with others who want to listen why is it dangerous is that why it's dangerous um it's it's dangerous because our society needs stability and so for example i i i understand open relationships and i think that you can be in a committed relationship while still experiencing sexuality with other people if that's agreed on with your partner uh, i think that can work but i would never promote that in public or to people, especially straight people that are in a committed relationship, because society needs structures, we need boundaries, we need, people need to discover things themselves in their own time, uh, with their own rules, if we completely destabilize everything. And that's what <clears throat> our, obviously, at the moment, we don't have any values in our society. And the deconstruction of values might work for incredibly evolved people, very, very intelligent people that dive into this deconstruction to find the value of rules and, and structure. But for the rest of society, you just throw them into chaos and they have no idea what to make of it. So that's why I think it's dangerous. Do you think that, that the... Um the push for uh, LGBTQ rights has kind of morphed or, or been hijacked. Like the, the push for rights has been hijacked by this uh, destabilizing force. Um, and is there a difference between pushing for rights for these individuals or pushing for acceptance and, um, and, and still stay uh, accepting that heteronormativity or the gender binary is actually more fundamental and, and I think, rule I think, exception. I think so what happened was that um, in the fight for equality for gays, lesbians and so on, we forced society to accept everything what we do and to incorporate our rules, the gay rules, so to speak, into their perception of, of society instead of saying, um, sure, we can respect you. If you play by our rules, which means if um, if you have sex on a public in a public place um, or on a gay pride, if you if you are on one of the um, how do you call these trolleys, the floats, yeah, yeah. If if you're on one of these floats at a gay pride and you have sex with another person, sorry, but I I, I can't respect you for that. I will call you out for your bullshit. Um, but instead, so that open flaunting of, uh, I guess kink once, once it went from pride being a celebration of the Stonewall riots into this parade of perversions, 
um, where you have... It's always been about perversions. It has always been about perversions. The gay lifestyle, and I'm, I can't talk about lesbians, but they're, it's very different. Like, gay, lesbian lifestyle and gay lifestyle has pretty much nothing in common. But the gay lifestyle has always been about promiscuity. And it's almost impossible to take that out because there are no female sexuality <clears throat> gatekeepers. So we are always more likely to engage in sexuality a lot. In Arabic countries, you think that there is less homosexuality in Arabic countries, but they all fuck with each other. Um, you just don't talk about it. And it's actually much more frequent than in the West because even straight guys, because they don't have access to women, they will just have sex with other men. Um, hmm. So men, men are very sexual. And if you, if you let them be sexual and if there are no restrictions, they will be sexual. So... <clears throat> And there will always be more promiscuity in the gay community. You can't stop that. But what you can do is you can give them positive role models and you can say, look, protect yourself. Um, don't let it become an addiction. Just because okay. you can doesn't mean you have to and you should. But all these things are completely absent in the gay community there are no warnings like there used to be warnings with protection but they are completely gone now nobody uses condoms anymore so do you think that there's a uh, i wonder if because the gay lifestyle at least in the west had you had to deviate uh, and and because uh, for some reason that that deviancy is built into the gay lifestyle that that deviancy always whenever there's any sort of rule even if it's a guardrail that guardrail has to be put out because deviancy is inherent in that in that culture itself and yes. and the, and the yeah. conditions that, that form that culture that that's exactly it i mean as a as a gay person you're per definition a pervert so to speak and it's kind mm. of like well i'm already out of the norms so fuck all the norms in some ways and i have noticed that quite a lot of gay men now uh, become more and more heteronormative, uh, getting married, uh, stop screwing around, taking less drugs. There is a clear movement away from the gay community, I would say, um, where, and, and I would say that more gay people start to become conservative, uh, or, or libertarians, uh, and step away yeah. from the insanity of, I mean, when you look at people like Dave Rubin, for example, uh, mm -hmm. who stepped away mm -hmm. and, uh, and he, he's a good example for a very heteronormative lifestyle, I would say. <clears throat> and do you think that <clears throat> it, that seems to be, um, part of Can society's greater acceptance of gay people as just gay and, and not needing to have them labeled as perverts. So that allows the gay people to not have to, to have more room to just be stabilized. But the weird thing or the interesting thing that I see in the rhetoric uh, around radical trans rights activism is that, or queer activism is that they, they vilify or they hate homosexuals who are acting heteronormative more than they even hate heteronormative people. Yeah, but that is um, that it's a power game. So where hmm. I, I'm a person, I don't want privileges. I joined the fire brigade here in Scotland, for example. And when I joined the fire brigade, I had to fill out a piece of paper asking me if I was white, brown, um, black, whatever, if I was straight, bisexual, gay, and so on. And so I tick bisexual because that describes closest what I am, even though I don't like boxes. And <clears throat> you are being treated better because you're not straight. So it's like, oh, we have a we have a non-straight person. That's amazing. We're so happy to have you. Where I'm like, so I put my penis into another guy's anus every once in a while. Why does that? make me better why am i more qualified as a firefighter because of that what's great about that i just want mm -hmm. to be treated exactly equal not i don't want to be discriminated against but i want to be treated be treated equal and i think a lot of gay men they are now at a point where they're like yeah just let me get on with my life i don't want a big fuss i i want to be normal 
<clears throat> lesbians have always been more political than gays. Gays were always about fun. Lesbians were about political activism. Uh, and I think the fun times are a little bit over for gay people. There are no more gay bars or very few gay bars. And and the, the gay culture crumbled and fell apart with social media and with dating apps uh, because you didn't have to go to gay bars anymore. You would just hook up with people online. So all the gay discos, gay bars, they disappeared. And then gay people just started to go to regular bars um, and hang out there, which obviously made them more heteronormative in some ways. Uh, mm. So, uh, so in some ways, they they just it just happened that they integrated themselves a bit more. Uh, and what lesbians, happens to all the activists activism that was attached? Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. The lesbians. Yeah, I, I would say that the lesbians they uh, are still very active in feminism, and now obviously they have a new battle ground which is transgenderism because they have to like define themselves against transgenderism the gens transgenderism has been co-opted by the extreme lefties <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so at, at the moment it's it's really not about inclusion or anything because if you really want inclusion then you highlight the humanity of people and you highlight that people are just the same as you and that they all just want to be happy and you don't force political um, bogus co political things like oh I need I need my own toilet mm -hmm. of, yes I, I to be honest I see all these problems yeah you there is an issue which toilet do you go to but most public places have a toilet for um, disabled people, for example, and there is absolutely nothing that keeps you from using that toilet. I think, and obviously, when you say, "But I'm not disabled," yeah, you're not disabled. But why do you make it more difficult for people to understand you and to say, "Well, they have a right to their dignity, so to speak." Uh, let's mm. let's let's try our best to 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 give it to them. And if that was the attitude. Um if that was the modal uh, uh, behavior of the activism, then uh, it would it would be much in more line acceptance. with. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the thing is, I mean, you talk to so many transgender people and detransitioning people, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of them they just wanted to be, um, they just wanted to live normal in in some ways, or they just wanted to get on with their life and not forcing people to give them brownie points just for being transgender mm -hmm. it's um can i <laughs> because we completely divert can i go back to my the evolution of my sexuality so yeah i was speak? gonna i was gonna ask you yeah Please. so so I, I I always had a bit of a problem with my sexuality, even though I was always fascinated by sexuality and I get, went to a lot of sex clubs and I watched people having sex, but it was always more analytical. I mean, I, 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 it, I was very attracted to the sexuality, but I didn't necessarily want to have sex. And the first um, experiences, sexual experiences, I'm like, I didn't feel too good about it. And it, I would say... It took me till I was 27 till I was like, okay, I'm mature enough to to really enjoy sex and to not feel bad about the encounters <clears throat> anymore. Up to that point, I felt not ready to make smart decisions, so to speak, or be fully in charge of my sexuality. <clears throat> and then I made... I had a lot of experiences, and I would say 80% of them were meaningless, 10% uh, were bad, and 10% were good. But, Ooh. and I just observed them, and I was like, oh, that, okay, that felt like this, this felt like that, this was good, this was bad. But for during this whole time, it was very clear to me that a relationship with men didn't make any sense to me, because for me, mm, I... I'm a man and I felt like another man at my side is just more of the same and I felt and I'm I I like men that are very manly so I like men that are 
that I can look up to or that are on the same level. But when you are in a relationship with somebody who's, let's say, higher in the hierarchy than you, but you are quite an alpha as well, that doesn't work too well. And if you're on the same level, then you constantly like fight for dominance. And, and also I was like, what does the other man bring to my life that I don't have myself? Um, and I could say friendship and camaraderie, but for that I don't need the, to have sex with the same person. Um, I did try relationships with men and they were exactly how I expected it to be. So I, I observed my relationships and I was like, yeah, that's, that's not me. That's, um, I, I'm playing a role of a relationship here, which obviously wasn't fair to my partners. I told them, I told my partners that from the get go, I always said, look, actually a relationship with the man doesn't make any sense to me. And they said, please try and I said yeah I should try because just because I have the feeling that it's not for me doesn't mean that I can be certain of that so I tried and I would say my yeah I was right with my initial feeling and at the most of my friends in my private life were straight I had very good oh I have very good gay friends uh, and all of them are mostly outside of the gay scene but uh, mm -hmm. a lot of my friends are straight and I had one straight friend that I was a little bit in love with and I had a crush on him and he uh, talked to me a lot about his sex life his straight sex life and uh, straight men are usually not very interested in listening to um, gay sex stories <laughs> so um, we talked mostly about his sex life and at one point it really bothered me that I couldn't participate in the conversation as well as I wanted to and I did have sex with um, women a couple of times when I was 18 and it was uh, biologically correct and it felt okay but I didn't feel emotionally connected. Mm. And But then at the age of 32 I was like ah, maybe I should try that again and my my real thought was maybe I should try that again it can't be worse than sex with man <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is sex with man is is cool but for me and I'm just talking about myself it lacks depth it's more fun and you don't have to invest a lot and I actually don't care a lot about the sexual act with a guy I I can just enter the sex and I'm like, yeah, let's have a little bit of fun. And I don't really care if the if the other guy is satisfied because I'm a man myself. And I was like, well, if the sex isn't super satisfying to me, I just jerk off afterwards. And so I have a little bit the same attitude when it comes to, to other men. Um, <clears throat> and then hmm. at the age of 32, I was like, I should try women again just to check out if that works for me now. And I found it incredibly difficult to engage with a woman for the first time again, because how do you do that? Do you go to a bar and say, hi, my name is Phil, I'm gay, but I would really like to try a vagina again. Um, so you're practically an experiment. That's, that's not cool. Not saying it feels cruel because it's a lie and like you're pretending that you're interested in the girl where you really just use her as an experiment so that wasn't fair either so after a couple of months of of, of thinking yeah I should really do that but not knowing how to do it I went to a brothel in Germany that's legal so we do have legal prostitution and it was a bizarre situation I actually like the brothel was quite far away I had to walk 45 minutes to get there which was intentional um, because I thought if I walk 45 minutes to get there uh, it's much less likely for me to um, <laughs> to just run away again without actually doing the deed <laughs> huh. Huh. so so I went there and there was only one girl left because it was 
just before they were closing and she was very beautiful a Russian girl but she didn't speak any wor word in German all she knew was telling me the price list which was very awkward because you can't talk about what's okay and and it, it felt very it, it didn't feel right for me and hmm. so I I paid for an hour and we went to the room and um uh, I I felt really bad because I didn't want to force her to do something that she didn't want to do and I'm a trained massage therapist and I said well uh, lay down so I gave her a massage because I thought well that's nice <laughs> <laughs> um and and so I gave her a massage. Afterwards, she said, oh, no, you lay down. She gave me a massage. And then she said, oh, now sex. And I, and it was incredibly unsexy, the whole situation, I would say. And yeah. I, I couldn't get an erection, which obviously is very difficult. And it makes you much more self-conscious. And you're like, oh, God, oh, God, what shall I do? Yeah. And so I told her to just... Give me, give me a little break, and I just closed my eyes, was fantasizing a little bit, and I um, got a little bit of an erection, then I put a condom on. And then she started with um, oral sex, and then she turned around, and I had sex with her, and <laughs> it was literally like, hallelujah! <laughs> it was so awesome. It was the, the feeling of... Uh, of entering the woman was so beautiful and right and and warm and 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 so different from having sex with a man um and even though there was no emotional connection unfortunately it it felt i felt much more connected than biologically connected than i did hmm. before um, and yeah so that that was that um and then afterwards, I thought, I had this thought, oh my God, that was really nice. I really liked that. And then I started to see women differently. And shortly afterwards, I was at a photo shooting. There was a, I was working as a model for like a fashion photo shoot. And my makeup artist, um, she, she was flirting with me. I was flirting with her. And bam, all of a sudden, I had a wonderful girlfriend. Um, <laughs> like a like almost like in a movie it was absolutely amazing it was great and unfortunately we're not together anymore but how was uh, it how was the quality of uh the relationship with with being in a relationship with a woman what what did you access with your own personality that hadn't been going I became, on i so she she had quite a few tattoos and she uh, was listen she listened to metal and stuff like that and she was a strong independent woman so she was she was a tough woman but still very feminine and when we entered the relationship you could tell that she became the woman she wanted to be and I became the man I wanted to be I because as a single I think you kind of have to play both roles you ha you have to be a bit of man and a bit of woman all all the time it's especially for a single parents for example they have to play both roles but you do the same thing when you're just a single and being with her I noticed that I became more masculine and that I how much I enjoyed <laughs> carrying the bags for her and opening the door and just being a gentleman while and she didn't expect any of that and she wasn't weak because of that it just um, it felt incredibly natural and the, and we were hundred percent equals. It, it it was amazing. It was absolutely hmm. beautiful. Kind of a yin yang uh, situation then. Yes, hundred percent, hundred percent. And and that's when I experienced that. I was like, oh, that's why a relationship with a man didn't work for me because it was the same. There was too much sameness, and I need the otherness of the woman to actually. Um, so that the re relationship creates something unique, something that hasn't been there before. And to me, I, I would I would love to have children. Uh, and to me, having children is the only real wonder in the world that we can be part of. The fact that you and 
somebody else creates something together that is a mix between you and the other person. Um, I think it's just absolutely beautiful. I'm not, I'm, I don't know if it will happen in my life. I will not have children if I don't find the wife that I can really love and, and that I want to have children with. Um, I, I hope it happens. Um, I would be very grateful for that. And earlier you said that there was a component of your homosexuality that was in seeking a father or, or trying to find a, a father outside of you. Um, d when you, I don't, I don't know, it didn't seem like you converted to heterosexuality, but, but you still, you still transitioned. Love men. <laughs> I, I still love men. So I would hmm. say like it's, it's, Life is this journey, and I think sexuality is a journey, even for straight people uh, or people that stay in their box, so to speak. Sexuality is a journey. We change over time, and we um, we create little fetishes, and certain things work better for us. And we're like, oh, I, I wasn't that much into cuddling when I was younger, but now I really appreciate it. I mean, this is a change in sexuality. Uh, people, it's not a very obvious change, but it still is a change and I would say that <clears throat> okay uh, are you a spiritual person yeah okay so I, I'm I have I need to go into a little bit of sp spirituality and I'm well aware that a lot of what I'm talking about might just be delusions and stuff like that um, but if they are delusions they are delusions that served me very, very well through my life. I have a very strong connection, or I feel a very strong connection to what I would call God. And um, I, I always felt this connection. But ever since I was a kid, my father issues were also spiritual issues. In some ways, I f because I didn't feel like my father's son. I felt like my mother's son, but I felt that that my father abandoned me. And in that context, I would call father God. Um, but hmm. I was absolutely fine with this abandonment because I, uh, and I, I do not come from a religious family, so I wasn't indoctrinated. All of this, what I'm saying here, really just came out of me. Um, as far as I know, uh, and you felt abandoned. Yeah. And I, I, I was, but in a, in an okay way, I was like, well, I'm here. I have a job to do. I've always felt like I was born for a purpose. I'm down here. I have a job to do. And, um, at, at the end of my job, I will go home. I will return to where I belong. Um, but this, this lack of father um, was always there and I was looking for it in other men but I was very well aware that looking for that was looking for a substitute for the real thing so I was aware of that <clears throat> I had a couple of traumas as a child I would say but I was always a fighter and I uh, I always said well that's a trauma. Look at the trauma. That's fine. But you can deal with that and you can move on. So I moved on and I always said to myself, um, at one point I will sit down and I will take off my armor as a, the armor of a warrior, so to speak. That, By the way, that's why I'm ta so heavily tattooed. And mm -hmm. I will heal. I will let the inner child heal, so to speak. Can you still follow me? Absolutely. Good. Um, and I became a little bit obsessed with this father figure that later on turned into a brother figure into a fellow warrior, into a comrade, somebody and everybody who's been in the military or who's, who's fought with other men understands what I'm talking about. Somebody who has your back, somebody you can really trust and I always had to 
play this role myself. So I always, I was always wearing my armor, and I said, "That's okay. I can take it. I'm strong." But at one point, <laughs> I was talking to God. I was like, "God, I, I'm, I'm fine with all of this. But at one point, you have to give me that person who, this brother, who can guard." Mm the fire who can guard the bonfire why while, while i take off my armor and heal and rest and sleep and i tried and i and i, I was looking for this person and while looking for this person i made i would say i made not bad choices but i projected this need onto certain men that i thought could play this role but it was projection um, I was talking yeah. about this man earlier on that I was in love with um, the guy that he was the reason why I started having sex with women again he was one of them and um, he is a little bit of a narcissistic personality so he was a very good he was a very good canvas to see everything in him that I needed to see and yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And he broke my heart as a friend. And uh, at the same time, I moved away from Germany to Scotland and I built my own house, which is a relatively big house. And I built it all by myself from scratch. It took me one and a half years. And during the one and a half years, I was living in a tiny garden shed with no heating, no water. Um, it was hardcore. So just to give an idea how hardcore it was, my bed was moldy during the whole time because it, everything was wet. It was Scotland. It was raining. So it was mm. horrible. Um, and during that time, I, I would cry myself to sleep almost every night out of physical exhaustion. And I had the friendship with this person, Martin. This friendship had broken before I moved to Scotland and I tried to fix it and it didn't work and he tr uh, acted like a real asshole. I have to defend him. Obviously, what I expected from him was he couldn't give me that. Yeah. So it was a little bit unfair and there's also my homosexuality. So I was also attracted to him. So it was never completely fair. Mm, but I had to separate myself from him to not suffer anymore. And it was the first time that I suffered that deeply for such a long time. And I and I did that voluntarily. I could have stopped that almost immediately, but I wanted to feel the pain. I wanted to feel human, so to speak, and to go through this process um, because I felt like I had to grow out of it. I had to learn certain lessons. And while I was in Scotland building my house, he, Martin, fucked up his marriage. He fucked up, he lost his house or his flat. He lost his job. He lost everything uh, because he lied to people. He had lied to people. And all of a sudden, he reached out to me. And all of a sudden, I was the stronger person. Hmm. And I was like, I was kind of like, uh, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> And I, I did open the, the relationship again, but not the friendship. I communicated with him, but I was in a position of strength and I still am, which is a bit, it's, it's a bit cruel because now I'm almost in his position and I don't like it very much, but I try not to be an asshole about it. Um, so this spiritual journey, when I started to build my house. I became the man that I needed to be and that I needed to look up to in some way. And not the full man, but a step higher. I became an adult. And my father, he was not a huge fan of me building the house in Scotland, but he helped me twice and he financially supported me a little bit. Not a little bit. He's financially supported me. And then my father said the magic words that he was proud of me. And my relationship to my father became very, very close and um, very trusting. And he respects me a lot now, which he couldn't really before because I was just the weirdo that looked like Marilyn Manson. Yeah. 
<laughs> and I would say that I'm going through a growing process of of growing into masculinity and and becoming the man that I am supposed to be. But for that, I do think that I need a female partner at one point. And uh, obviously the full journey is fulfilled when, if I become a father, if I take responsibility, um, if I, if, if I, if I leave certain aspects of, of the youth behind and I have friends from the military that, that are envious of me because I'm so free and they're like, dude, you, you want a family? I have five kids that I can't see <laughs> and I, I lost my house and I lost everything and hmm. blah, blah, blah. And you can just travel around. And I was like, I would give everything to not to swap places because they obviously lost their children, but I would give everything to be able to take this next step. But it's a ne it's a step that I can't take by myself. I, I need this other person to do this step. Mm -hmm.